Hello everybody and welcome back to the second channel. This is a different kind of video, now Books Weekly, because I've filmed that already, but I've spent the better part of the last couple of days watching other people's favorite book of 2016, the worst book, the best book, all those lists, top 10, top 15, and I love those videos. I really, really do, and there are a lot of books that I've never heard of and sound interesting, so great videos to make. Only problem, I couldn't come up with a coherent list of, of favorite books or, or top reads or best books of 2016. Even though I had a really, really good reading year, I read about 135 books plus a couple of rereads, and there were a lot of good books in there, books I really loved, books I thought were excellent, but still, it, I, I don't know, I, I couldn't come up with a list. So I decided to have a different approach to the top five, or in my case, three books list. I went through my reading and of all the books that I've read new in 2016, so not the rereads and only the novels, and I asked myself which book did really stuck with you in a way that you would want to reread it. And three books stuck with me in that way. And they were not even necessarily the books I would consider the best books I've read, but somehow these books touched me in a way that other books didn't. So here is my top three sort of list. And the first of those three books is Antonia Hayes' Relativity. Antonia Hayes is a young Australian author and Relativity, published in 2015, is her first novel. The book is about Ethan, a 12-year-old boy who's extremely gifted and obsessed with astronomy and physics, so there is quite some physics stuff in the book which appealed to me because I'm a nerd. Um, and the book is also about his mother Claire, who left the father after an incident that is explained later in the book. Um, Claire was a quite successful dancer, but gave up dancing to care for her son, because he has some medical problems due to the incident that is explained later in the book. And the incident, spoiler alert if you haven't read the book, um, is that Ethan had experienced shaken baby syndrome. His father shook him when he was very little and he had some brain damage and epilepsy as a, a, a result of that. Um, wh why this book stuck with me so much is not only because I, I, I loved the physics stuff and everything, but the core of the book is about guilt, about whether or not the father did what he was accused of and tried for and convicted for, abusing the child by shaking it. The father always claimed that he was innocent, that he didn't do anything, and I'm not going to spoil you the ending when we will learn whether or not the father actually did what he was convicted for, but the way the book dealt with this guilt issue, I thought was so inventive and new and special in a way that, that this really stuck with me. And I, I, I loved the writing also, but the, the core why, why I want to reread this book is the way in which it, it deals with the question of guilt. 2016 was also the year that I read almost all of Lionel Shriver's books, an author, American-born author now living mostly in, in the UK, I really love. I read her latest novel, The Mandibles, didn't think it was her best, but still enjoyed it. And I worked my way through her books after having read We Need to Talk About Kevin, I think, I don't know, a year ago or something. And one of her books, is also in my top three list, and that is So Much For That. So Much For That is Lionel Shriver's 10th novel. She published it in 2010. Um, you probably know Lionel Shriver from her best-known book, 
we need to talk about Kevin, about a school shooting, and also about a mother who does not like her son. Um, and Lionel Shriver, well, she's not afraid of controversial issues, of tackling issues that are central to our modern lives and give it a controversial spin. And she does the same with so much for that. The book is all about illness and medical care and death. The main character, Shep, and his wife, Glennis, are the central two characters. The book is told from Shep's perspective, and Shep has worked in a job all his life that he didn't like. He made some money, he saved money, and the idea was that at a certain point when they are middle-aged, like they are now, they would take the savings and move to a cheap third world country and spend their savings there because there the savings would last them for the rest of their lives. But it never came to that somehow. Glenn has always had excuses why it was not a good time or the island was not beautiful enough. Or... So the book opens when Shep made a decision. He will give his wife an ultimatum. He will leave now. He bought three tickets for himself, his wife and their teenage son uh, to an island off the coast of Tanzania and either Glennis goes with him and they take their son with them or Shep will go along. But the same evening he makes this announcement, Glennis has an announcement of her own. She just had been diagnosed with terminal cancer, a very virulent, aggressive form of cancer caused by asbestos. And of course Shep can't leave. So in the course of the book we see what happens with Glennis, the treatment, the cost of the treatment, how the American medical system works or, or doesn't work because although they are insured Shep has to pay most of what he saved for medical bills um, and there's more illness in the book because Shep's best friend and business partner um, his daughter has a very rare genetic disorder, disease, which means she's now in her early teens, which will mean she will never live to see her 20s. And then Shep's friend also encounters some medical problems, which I will not spoil for you. I will only tell you it has to do with plastic surgery gone horribly wrong. So medicine, illness, death is the central theme of the book. And what I always liked about Lionel Shriver is that she doesn't shy away from controversy. Because the questions she asks in the book can be deemed controversial. Is it valid that you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the treatment for Glennis when you know it will only prolong her life maybe for one or two months and miserable months because it's chemotherapy, is that really worth it? Should we approach illness in that way? Shriver also asked the question how we deal with death because two characters, Glennis and the daughter of Shep's friend, will die soon. Glennis is in denial. She doesn't want to think about dying. She thinks she will get better. Is that the right approach? Or does it mean that it will prevent her and her husband to say goodbye properly and to talk about Shep's life after Glennis died? So the book stuck with me because of the questions, the controversial and difficult and, and not pleasant questions that Shriver asks in the book and is not afraid to put to the reader. And the last book is a science fiction book of an author I will shamefully admit that I hadn't read until this year. And the author is Octavia Butler and her book is the first book in her Xenogenesis series and it's called Dawn. Dawn is a first encounter book. The main character is Lilith who just lost her husband and son in the final stages of an atomic nuclear war on the Earth. The Earth is almost completely uninhabitable. Uh, the human race is on the verge of its extinction and is saved by aliens, the Onkali, who come to the Earth and rescue a 
couple of humans, put them to sleep, and a hundred years later, Lilith is awakened again and has to face this alien race. And then in the book, the story is told how these two races, Lilith and the Oankali, how they interact, because the Oankali are very strange. They are obviously very hard to look at. They are, have a, a quite a high or yuck factor when you look at them. And it also deals with the question that the Oankali will reinvigorate the Earth, will make it inhabitable again, but at a price. Because the Oankali are an alien race who yeah, in a way, hop from planet to planet, rescue species who are on the verge of extinction in order to genetically pool with them, make children with them. And I, I thought this book as a first encounter book was so different from any other science fiction first encounter book I've ever read. Uh, the way it, it asks the question, how do we deal as a human race with this possibility of collaborating with the aliens, should we do it or not, but also the world building, how the race building is more because the way um, Octavia Butler invents this new race of the Oankali with three genders, it, it's just fantastic. And if you've never read Octavia Butler, like I never did until this year. I think Dawn is one of the best books to start with. The two other books in the series are also really very good, following what happens with Earth and us inhabitants afterwards. But um, for me, Dawn is the best book in the series, and it, it really stuck with me, made me think about what I would do when I would if I were in Lilith's shoes and how a first encounter with a really very different race could evolve and and what would happen after that. So those were my three more or less top three books of 2016. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this different top three list. I wish you all a very very splendid good fantastic sparkling start of 2017 and I will see you next year. Bye bye!